we're going to uh, spend a little bit of time looking at a very interesting part of the Bible, and I've really loved uh, looking at this over the last week or so. Um, as Tim said, we're reading through the Bible uh, together as a church, and we're up to the story of King Solomon. Now, just a little bit of a recap. Uh, the, the story of the Bible is the story of how God started with one man, Abraham, and he made Abraham into a great nation. He works with that nation because he wants to train that nation, put things into that nation until eventually he will send that people, his family, goes out to the ends of the earth because God wants to take his message of restoration right out to the ends of the earth. And we're at that part of the story after God has delivered his people from slavery in Egypt and he's brought them into the promised land and he raises up a godly king for him. This is really cutting a long story short. Uh, he raises up a godly king for him. His name is David. You've probably heard of David if, uh, if, if you're visiting. You certainly would have if you've been following this journey. Uh, David builds this kingdom up. He, he unites the kingdom of uh, the, the tribes of Israel and he builds the kingdom up and it's a time of great prosperity and his son Solomon takes over. And this is when the kingdom of Israel just, this is like the golden age of the kingdom of Israel. But the thing about the story of Solomon is that it is in every way a tragedy. It's a tragedy. It's a tragedy because things go so well, actually. Things build up so much, but in the end, it all falls down in the end. And it's been interesting that so many people who perhaps had forgotten the story of Solomon or read the story of Solomon in the last little while, have been really disappointed, even devastated, by the fact that there just isn't really a happy ending to this story. It just goes really, really badly in the end. And stories should have happy endings. Well, the story of the Bible overall has a happy ending, but the bit in the middle is pretty messy. And certainly the story of Solomon is a tragedy. We're not used to tragedies. Tragedies are, are of course, a part of... Uh, literature and storytelling have been for a long time. You know, Shakespeare wrote tragedies. Uh, Hamlet is a tragedy. They all end up dead in the end. Romeo and Juliet is a tragedy. Romeo and Juliet is basically like the princess bride, except they all end up dead in the end. I think that's a fair uh, summary. It's a very non-literary summary of... Um, Romeo and Juliet, Othello, Macbeth. Actually, they all end up dead in the end, don't they? Uh, this is a part of, uh, it's a part of our, our literary tradition, but we're used to the Hollywood narrative these days. We feel that we have a right to a happy ending. Well, it's actually very important to the message that the writer of Kings, who records the story of Solomon, of course, is also recorded in the book of Chronicles, but it's important to the writer of Kings, that when we finish reading the story of Solomon, we are devastated. He wants us to be devastated. It's part of the message, because this is not just something that happened to Solomon. It's something that happens all the time. When God pours blessing into someone's life, that is the, often, that becomes the most dangerous moment when God empowers people. It's great because God wants to do that, God is a God who wants to bless and empower, but there's something about the human heart that when we receive that, we just cannot steward that well. We have this habit of turning blessing into curse. We see it throughout Scripture in many ways. We see it throughout history in many ways, and I think if you search your heart, you will find that maybe you have done it. And I certainly, as I look at my life, I've recognized there are too many times in my life where I've turned the blessing of God into curse. So it's good to think about this tonight. The writer of Kings wants the people that were reading his story, the story and the history that he was telling, he wanted them to realize and own the tragedy of their life. Because when we own that tragedy, when we recognize where we went wrong, the good news is, and there is always good news, the moment we recognize where we went wrong, we can be restored and turned around. That is the gift that God gives us in Jesus Christ. We can always have a new start. We just have to recognize where we took the wrong turn. The story of Solomon, as I said, is initially a story of great successes. And uh, I want to give you the History Channel summary uh, of the story of Solomon. He, of course, inherited um, a lot of wealth from his father. He benefited 
from the unity of the kingdom, also a time of great peace. He exploited the security and the resources. Times of peace, of course, in the ancient world, uh, the constant warring is what often inhibited nations from developing. This was a time of great peace because God had blessed David in his various military exploits, and Solomon uh, makes it, uh, takes advantage of this. And he can do that because God gave him wisdom. This is the uh, first thing that we read about Solomon. God says, I'll give you whatever you want. And Solomon says, give me wisdom, Lord, so I can lead your people really well. It's a wonderful thing. It starts off, Solomon's heart is in the, in the right place. He's a seeker of God. You know, see, this isn't the story of a guy that starts offering. He's a guy that starts off with a real heart for God. And God gives him wisdom. Part of that wisdom is sheer business acumen. This guy's a brilliant businessman. And he takes advantage uh, of this situation. He also uh, fully exploits the strategic economic position on the trade route between the great empires of the north and the south. Um, Israel, of course, is in a narrow, narrow strip of land. Uh, anyone who was anyone in trade in those days between the great empires in the south and the north, they went past your, fr your, past your front, front door. So Solomon controlled a very important bit of land, and he utilized it very well to... Um, develop lots of profitable trade alliances. He also developed a trade fleet with the help of the Phoenicians, who were just on the coast, just up the north, Tyre. It was a very famous uh, port, and the Phoenicians uh, helped Solomon to develop a, a fleet of ships, and Solomon worked with them um, in a number of ways, and I'll, I'll mention that in a, in a moment. There was all of this trade then, all of this shipping happening. One of the other things that's not so well known uh, about Solomon is that he developed copper mining. I told you this is going to be History Channel. Are you still with me? You're right. Uh, he developed copper mining. Now, this isn't mentioned in the book of Kings, uh, but we know this from history, and it's alluded to actually in the book of Deuteronomy. We'll see that in a moment. He develops, and actually at the, in the Gulf of Aqaba, which is the the right-hand finger of the you know, top part of the Red Sea, uh, he establishes there the largest, the largest copper smelting factory in the ancient world at the time. And from here, ships went out to all different parts of the world exporting Solomon's copper. Massive copper mines, they're still there. Uh, today you can see uh, a picture of that. Solomon makes a huge amount of money from this as a result of this, he's exceedingly wealthy. There's more mention of gold in the story of Solomon than anywhere else in Scripture. It's gold, 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 gold. You can see it here. It's all through uh, this story. Gold, gold. And with all of this gold, Solomon was able to build for himself a, a palace that was virtually unrivaled in the ancient world. It was a beautiful, great palace. Uh, he takes a lot of time to build this. 13 years uh, which, by the way, is nearly twice the amount of time that it took to build the temple. The, the temple for God uh, took seven years. The palace for Solomon took 13 years. And he poured uh, enormous resources into that. He made a massive throne for himself. Here's an artist's impression of that. A uh, pretty good artist's impression, I think. It was covered, his throne was covered with ivory and overlaid with gold, and he just wanted to wow anyone that came to him. It would have been, the wow factor would have been massive. If you, uh, if you were in a king in those days, you know, it's important to look successful. You've got to look successful. So people want to be your friend. You know, people want to be, I want to be friends with this guy. Well, everyone wanted to be friends uh, with Solomon. And he made lots of alliances, lots of friendships during this uh, time. Now, the interesting thing, about the way that this is described. That's a summary of his successes. There's something very interesting in the way that all this is described by the writer of Kings. The writer of Kings describes this in a way that clearly he wants to say this is clearly the fulfillment of God's promises. God made this promise to Abraham. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. This promise and many after that God made to his people, first to Abraham and then many times after, we see this clearly exhibited in the life of Solomon. The writer wants us to see that in all of this, despite what Solomon does with it, God actually is being faithful. Solomon is being blessed by God according to the promise. Solomon, uh, Israel becomes a great nation according to the promise here. They're blessed with great prosperity. Solomon, of course, becomes very famous for his wisdom. People come from all over the place to consult the, the famous wisdom of Solomon. And people from the ends of the earth come to see 
Solomon. And so he's a blessing to the ends of, earth, the, ends of the earth. This is the significance of the Queen of Sheba, the visit of the Queen of Sheba. Not, we're not quite sure where Sheba is. Most popular theory is that it's in Ethiopia. There's also a theory that it's down on the tip of the Arabian Peninsula around where Yemen is. The point, actually, of Sheba is that it represented the edge of the known world. That's the important thing about Sheba. So there is this direct allusion to the fulfillment in these narratives of God's promises to Solomon. And yet, at the same time, in the same breath, as it, as it were, as these things are being described as God's blessing, we see signs of warning. We read things that, if you're familiar with the book of Deuteronomy, are really concerning. Let me give you an example. Deuteronomy 17 says this. Deuteronomy 17, verse 16. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself. Think about this. Remember that. He must not acquire great numbers of horses. You know, what's a great number? I mean, you read, you know, ancient stories of Alexander the Great and other generals like Xenophon or whoever, and, you know, there's hundreds, many hundreds of horses. And, you know, let's think about uh, what, what is a great number of horses. Well, keep that in mind. Uh, and it says, or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has said to you, you are not to go that back, back that way again. So remember that, not, big, not large amounts of horses, Certainly don't go back to Egypt for them. Then the second thing, he must not take many wives. Now, if you ask me, two would be many. Uh, Ten, that's many. Twenty, that's just getting ridiculous. You know, really. Uh, He must not take many wives because kings in those days showed off their influence and their wealth through how many wives they had. It was the biggest show-off thing. That's your, that's your trophy cabinet. God's saying, don't do that. Don't do that. I'll bless you. I'm the one that lifts your name. You don't need to show off. So don't have many wives. Well, let's think about what many wives is, uh, and we can have a look at that later. Or his heart will be led astray. It says, and he must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. Now, hold on to these three things. And in the light of this, let's read 1 Kings chapter 10. Here it is, verse 21. All King Solomon's goblets were gold, and all the household articles in the palace of the forest of Lebanon were pure gold. Nothing was made of silver, because silver was considered of little value in Solomon's days. That's because there was so much gold. The king had a fleet of trading ships at sea, along with the ships of Hiram, that's the king of Tyre, the Phoenician, Once every three years it returned carrying gold, silver, and ivory, and apes and baboons. What what the heck? Apes and baboons. I think that's part of the wow factor. It must be. Because I can't think of any other deep, you know, deep biblical meaning for that. I looked, I thought about it. Thought, don't know what's going on there. Verse 26, Solomon accumulated. Here it is, look at this. Solomon accumulated chariots and horses. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horses. Now, if you ask me personally, that's what I call many. That's what I would call many. Wouldn't you call that many? I would call that many. 12,000 horses, which he kept in the chariot cities. He built cities for all the chariots. And also with him in Jerusalem. The king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones and cedar as plentiful as sycamore fig trees in the foothills. Solomon's horses were imported from Egypt and from Q, which is up in Asia Minor, today's Turkey or somewhere near there. The royal merchants purchased them from Q at the current price. Now, the, the real thing, though, that was a mark of, as I said, of success in the ancient world was wives. And this, is, this wasn't just to show uh, that you were Mr. Studley. It was to show that actually you were successful in a number of different ways because every marriage for a king represented a political alliance, every marriage. Uh, if you wanted to make an alliance with a king, then you would marry that king's daughter. Now, Solomon really kicked the ball out of the park, to use a sporting analogy, which I don't do very often. 
he really kicked the ball out of the park because he, he got Pharaoh's daughter. Now, that's a big deal in the ancient world. Egypt was the greatest empire at the time. Pharaohs married the daughters of other kings, but they very rarely gave their daughters away in marriage to kings. So this is a, this is a sign of, of immense success and, and influence. This is how influential Solomon is uh, at this stage. Uh, the, Solomon's, uh, Solomon's wife, uh, Pharaoh's daughter, high-maintenance girl, she, he built a palace just for her. In fact, we need to remember that all of these girls, all of these princesses, they are, well, princesses, aren't they? So he's got to keep them happy. He's got to make sure that these alliances are healthy. So he's got to go their way. He's got to let them do what they want to do. And so we read this at the end of the life of Solomon 1 Kings 11. It says, King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. They were from the nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after other gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. That also, in my personal opinion, would be many. That would be many. 700 wives, 300 concubines. Concubines uh, were, lacked the status sufficient to be married to, to a king. Uh, so that probably is the Mr. Studley part. I don't know. Uh, but the wives, 700 wives, this is a trophy cabinet for Solomon. I mean, he has built immense power for himself. And it says here, tragically, the end of verse 3, and his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of his father David had been. It's so incredibly tragic. And you ask the question at the, at the end of the life of Solomon, how did all of this happen? How did this happen? You see, you get this sense that Solomon is blessed with all of this wisdom, right? And he builds this kingdom up. And God pours so much into his life and we see, and it is absolutely God's faithfulness and God prospers him and things go really well. But it's like Solomon runs away with this. He starts to build an identity for himself. It becomes, he, he clothes himself in it. And he, he runs away with it. And in the end, he builds, he builds all of this up. And it's almost, you get the impression that in the end, Solomon is controlled by the life that he builds. He's controlled, rather than him controlling his life, he is controlled by the life that he built. You know how easily that can happen? That can happen so easily. Where you think, I want to build up a successful life and I want to... Um, I want to build up all of this stuff, and you build, and sure, you build up this life, but the, to maintain that is an absolute mission to maintain that feeling of constant success, that feeling of constant material gratification, that constant sense of identity. As you, it's, it's so laborious to maintain that. You just exhaust yourself, and it ends up that you are oppressed by the life that you chose to lead. And this is what you actually see in the life of Solomon. It actually starts to look completely exhausting as we look at poor old Solomon and we see what he has to do to keep up and feed this enormous machine. I mean, this glorious court that he built. I mean, yes, it was impressive, but with all of these officials, it cost a huge amount to maintain this. He had to tax his people. There hadn't really been taxation before in Israel. This is the first time that what we would know as taxation is introduced into Israel during the life of Solomon. Not only that, but Solomon reorganizes what was previously the 12 tribes of Israel. People lived in their tribal districts. He reorganizes the land of Israel according to tax, 
taxation districts. And th these taxation districts, a lot of people miss this, but it's there in the text. These taxation districts cut across traditional tribal boundaries. Now, this is a problem because in these days, the people's identity, their sense of connection with the covenant that God had made with the people of Israel, their sense of identity as the covenant people came from their tribal identity. So I am a member of the tribe of Naphtali or the tribe of Dan or the tribe of Asher or the tribe of Judah or so forth. But what happens during the time of Solomon, because he's got completely different priorities now, he's, and he has to feed this thing and he organizes these taxation districts and he, and he has to, he implements forced labor, mind you, to build all of these wonderful things. He has to force the people into conscripted labor. So there's lots of movement of population. He's cutting across tribal boundaries. People are losing their sense of identity. Things are happening here that are a big problem. He's overworking the people. That's going to be a big problem. In fact, in the next generation, there's going to be a revolution because of that. And it's all going to crumble. It's all going to fall to pieces. Not only that, but at the end, and again, a lot of people miss the significance of that, Solomon has to sell 20 towns to the king of Hiram, to, to Hiram, the king of Tyre. This Phoenician king, Tyre, is the capital of Phoenicia. He sells 20 Israelite towns. Even the Israelites weren't allowed to permanently sell or buy the land. Because God said, I have given you this land as a gift. But Solomon sells it to pay his debts to Hiram, king of Tyre. And it's unheard of. And it's all starting to fall to bits. And you sense that Solomon's been controlled by the life that he has built. You need to think really hard about the sort of life that you want to lead. Because this isn't just something that happened to Solomon. It happens all the time. And it's so tragic and the writer of Kings wants us to see the tragedy. Not only that, but the writer of Kings wants to, and he describes it in such a way that clearly alludes to warnings. God knew that this would happen. God knew that there is a danger. God knew that we are never more in danger than when we are blessed. Does that sound strange to you? You might think, oh, I'm in the most danger when I'm in times of struggle and trial. When I lack things, that's when I'm most in danger. No, no. You are most in danger when you are most blessed. God always warned his people about that. I'm going to show you Deuteronomy chapter 8. It's as though the story of Solomon is written in such a way to remind us continually this is exactly what God said would happen. Let's have a look at Deuteronomy chapter 8. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks, streams, deep springs gushing out into valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing, a land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. There's the allusion to the copper and Solomon was the first to exploit this as part of what made him very, very wealthy. God, so I'm giving you all of this. Verse 10, when you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be very careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, his decrees that I'm giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your flocks and herds grow large and your silver and gold increase, and when all that you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud. And you will forget the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And you may say to yourself, my power and my strength, the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gave you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. Remember that God is the God who empowers. He wants to bless you. This is what happens. If you put your life in God's hands, he will empower you and he will increase your capacities and as a result, things will go well with you. 
because God wants to bless you. But you need to recognize that you are in a very dangerous place because we're not good at stewarding. There's something about the human heart that when we are empowered, somehow it all goes to our head. And we need to be vigilant about this. Doesn't stop, this is the interesting thing, it doesn't stop God wanting to empower us because it's what God does. He wants to empower us. He wants to bless us. But we've got a problem in receiving that. And we see it again and again and again. I don't know how many times as a pastor I've seen people go through times where they're just really seeking something for God. You know, I want to get into this university. I want to get this career. I want to get this job. And, and, or, or, you know, there's something lacking and they're really praying for that and seeking God for that. And, and, and then the moment they receive it, the moment that God blesses them and gives them their heart's desire, you never see them again. So thanks, God. See you later. And off they go. They hold on to it and run away. Jesus, during the time of Jesus, there's a story about 10 lepers that Jesus healed. Who knows this story? How many of them came back to Jesus? One. The others just said, Thank, thanks, Jesus, that's great. We're off. Never saw them again because they've got what they want. There's something terribly wrong with that. And let me tell you what it is. Let me ground it in what God really wants. Let me help you to understand why it is that God blesses us. And because God, in everything that God does, God wants to constantly tell us that he's looking after us, that he loves us. Life is about interaction with God. It's about interaction with God. God does something in our lives and we interact, we, we respond to that. Let me use an illustration. Everything that God puts into our lives is a little bit like the role of an engagement ring. You know, picture the scene, you know, the restaurant, table in the restaurant and uh, two young, lovely young couple and he brings out the engagement ring, sits it on the table. Imagine, you know, he sticks the engagement ring on the table, she picks up the ring whoa, is that, that must be worth about three grand. Is that pure gold there? And just walks off, thanks, see ya. No, no, hang on, that's not the point. You haven't really, you haven't quite got the point of this. You know, goes and sells it, you know, down at cash converters. <laughs> thanks heaps, awesome. No, no, sorry, you haven't got, you haven't quite understood the role of that blessing says something. God is speaking to you through that. And he wants you to respond. He wants you to come back to him, just like that one leper. This is the thing that grieved Jesus. He said, where are the other nine? Where are they? And one came back. God wants interaction. This is what we see in Deuteronomy chapter 8. This is the simple but profound thing that God says to us, this is what you must do. Here it is. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. It's so simple. I was looking for some deeply profound thing to share with you tonight, some complex five-step process to avoiding all of this, to not being Solomon. You know, it's got to be, I thought, I've got to do something impressive, but... No, it's actually very simple. But I want, to, I want to help you to understand what this means. When God puts something into your life, it's really, really important that you immediately give it back. Because our tendency is to hold on to it and run away with it. We're a little bit like, imagine, and we are a little bit like this, like orphans that are used to living out in the street stealing and grabbing and grasping everything and running away and hoarding things up. And, and we're used to living like that. 
And then imagine, you know, God brings us into his household and he sits us at the table and he puts us his best silver out, you know, just like in Les Miserables with Jean Valjean and all of that. You know, he puts his best silver and we're like wowed by all of this stuff in the household and we, you know, we put it in our pockets and we go through the house and, you know, God has made us part of his family. It's kind of all ours anyway. But we put it all in our pockets and we hold it and we run away with it and we go off and live in the dark and the cold. And we wonder why we're lonely and empty. And God says, what are you doing? I blessed you so that we could have a a relationship. I'm speaking to you through this blessing. But you just took it and you just ran off with it. And then you find yourself in the dark and in the cold. Don't do that. When God blesses you, give it back. Give it back to God. This is what praise is. Praise is about giving it back to God. There are many ways of doing this. Interesting, in the, in the Torah, in the Old Testament law, one of the most important ways of doing this was about bringing back your first fruits. You know, when the crops brought about their fruit, crops and the herds, and when they uh, drew the wealth out of the land, God said, Bring it back to me, quickly. First thing, the first fruits. Bring me back a tithe, 10% of all of your wealth. Bring it back to me. He constantly said to bring back offerings. It's not because God needed that. God didn't need that. He says, bring it into the house of God and share it together. Quickly, bring it back. Give it back to God. So that immediately you are acknowledging, oh, this comes from God. Listen, I reckon there are many people here Possibly. God has blessed, he's he's poured such goodness into your life. And often when God does that, that, I want to underscore the fact. It's the most dangerous moment in your life because of human nature. Because of this orphan mentality that we have. Oh, I've been given something. Quickly, run away with it. No, no, God, don't, 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 don't run away. Don't run away with it. Give it back to God in praise. Give it back to God in offering. Bring your life back to God. Stay in the house. Stay in the household of God. Stay in the family. And God will give and give and give. And he will pour into your life. Doesn't mean that God, if you lack things, doesn't mean that God isn't blessing you. Because God is far more concerned because of this very reason. He's far more concerned with building your character than he is with building your success. And often what God does is that he builds character so that we can steward success. I remember once I, thinking about the the roles that I fulfill in in my life, particularly this role, I remember praying and saying to God, God, I just, I've been reading Paul talking about, you know, I'm not just coming to you with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. I said, God, I want to see more power and more fruit. I mean, all good prayers, right? I want to see more power and more, you know, more of everything, basically. And I, and I distinctly felt God say to me, you can't handle it. You can't handle more. You're already struggling to steward what I've already given you. You're wearing it like a badge. You're running away with it. It's taking you into self-subsistence. I remember that. It was many years ago, but I remember that moment distinctly. We are never in a more dangerous position than when we are blessed. It's strange, isn't it, that we should say that about ourselves. And this is what I think God's saying to us. I think God's saying, I really want to bless you. I want to empower you. I want to take your capacities and make them more than you've ever dreamed that they could be. I want to make you into, this, into a person you never dreamed you could be. But can, can, can you be trusted with that? God is saying, can, can I trust you with that? Can I put this blessing into your hand? And can you not run away with it? Will you stay with me? Will you walk with me? Will you give it back? So that every time God blesses you, 
It's all about interaction. God blesses you. You give it back in praise. God, this is all you. And then God blesses you again, and you give it back. See, this is the sort of life that I want to live. This is the sort of life that I want to live. Constant interaction. And the interesting thing is, you actually enjoy every aspect of your life so much more. Because it's such an onerous task running away with it, trying to hold on to it. It's a curse when you are controlled by what you have. When your life controls you. And it's so wonderful when you can look at all that God has given into your life and you can return it in praise. This is what the Lord has done for me. And you give it right back. I'm giving it right back to God today. I'm not going to run away. I'm going right back to God. Let's go right back to God. And I want us to do that together tonight as we share communion together. The interesting thing about these elements, Jesus, when he gave them to us, he wanted to us to be constantly reminded of the greatest thing that God did for us, which is to come in Jesus Christ and to bear the penalty for our guilt in our place so that we could have a completely fresh beginning. And he gave us these elements, the bread that represents the broken body of Jesus, the cup that represents the shed blood of Jesus. And Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Don't, don't forget me. Don't forget me, God says. And tonight, I want us to bring an offering of praise to God. I want us to reconnect with God, to remember what God has done for us. I want you to stand for us. I'm going to get the music team uh, to come up. As the music team is playing, I invite you to come up and spend this time remembering there are things in your life that God has done. And it's really important for you that you recognize that this is from God. This is on loan to you. Don't run away, but it's on loan to you. And it always will be because you're part of the household of God. And thank God for those things. Recognize what God has done for you. Let's do this in remembrance of God and what he has done for us in Jesus Christ. As the music team is playing this song, I encourage you to come up in your own time. Take the bread, take the cup. Find yourself some space. Have a moment and praise God. Give it back to God. Give all of that blessing. Give it back to God in praise tonight. Let's do this together. Thanks, guys.